and thank you for joining me here today at Why the Book Wins, where I compare books with their movie adaptations. My name is Laura, and today I am talking about the movie Dumb Money, directed by Craig Gillespie, released in 2023, and I'm comparing it with the nonfiction book The Antisocial Network, the GameStop short squeeze, and the ragtag group of amateur traders that brought Wall Street to its knees by Ben Meserich, released in 2021. And as you can tell by the title, this story is about the whole thing that happened in January of 2021. I mean, it started earlier than that, but January of 2021 is when it hit its height, where these people on Reddit caused the GameStop stock to skyrocket. And so everybody that was betting against GameStop, you know, the big hedge funds that are, you know, like multi-million dollar companies, they ended up losing like billions of dollars. And so it's a very, you know, David versus Goliath kind of a story. And to get started with the book review, so this book was published in September of 2021. So it was very soon after the events. It like seems like it was too soon that they wrote this book when it like they should have waited to see how things played out a bit more. But regardless, this came out in September of 2021. And for the most part, I did really enjoy it. I found it very engaging and it is written in a creative nonfiction kind of way, which is just easier to read. And some nonfiction, which I do like nonfiction, but it can sometimes be a bit dry or dense at times. And I did not have that complaint with this book. I will say for the most part, the book is written in like a third party viewpoint where they're not giving their opinions per se, they're just telling the story. But then when he starts talking about Ken Griffin of Citadel, suddenly Mesrich he becomes just like a very clear presence as you're reading the book because he is clearly stating his opinion on this man. And so it just felt like very jarring because for the most of the book, it's just written like a normal book kind of way. And then suddenly he's like making these sarcastic comments <laughs> about Ken Griffin. And so I like, I'm fine with Mesrich having his own opinions on things, but I just wish he hadn't written it in that way because it just felt out of place compared to the rest of the book. But for example, when we are first introduced to Griffin, he like sarcastically is saying that he has a throne of skulls, but it reads, Ken Griffin almost certainly wasn't sitting on a massive ivory white throne made of the skulls and the bleached and polished skeletal remains of the many enemies he'd vanquished on his way to the top of the financial industry. Such a throne, if it had existed, which it most certainly did not, would have been just the sort of thing to set the mood, you know, yada, 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 whatever he says. And he makes multiple jokes about this throne of skulls he sits on. And again, it just felt out of place. You know, like reading this story, I'm on the side of like Keith Gill and the Redditors, right? Like, I'm not rooting for Ken Griffin. So it's not like I'm like offended he would say such a thing about him. It just felt out of place. And when I read a nonfiction book, even creative nonfiction, I just want it to be more of like an equal bias telling of the events, right? Whereas this, like there were times where he definitely was biased. Also, another complaint I have is how repetitive it could be at times. Like specifically when talking about Reddit, like so often he reminds us like, oh, the Reddit thread, they're so vulgar and derogatory about themselves, the way they talk. And like, oh, they always refer to themselves as apes and whatever. And like constantly <laughs> throughout the whole book, we're reminded of this, like, yeah, we know how the Reddit people talk. You don't need to remind us about it like every few pages. But aside from those complaints, like I said, I did find it very informative and very engaging. And it did get to a point where like maybe halfway through the book or so, I did have a hard time putting it down. So it was like one I wanted to keep reading. And I thought he did do a good job at conveying like the hope and the solidarity of this event and why it was so important to these individual people while also showing though how like unfair the system is, right? Because big money, they're always gonna win, right? Cause that's just the way the system is rigged. And so it was kind of a good mix of like hope and inspiration while also just showing how the way the world is set up can kind of suck too. And then onto the movie review. So I was very excited for this movie, partly because I really enjoyed the book. I know I just complained about it a fair amount, but for the most part, I did enjoy the book. And I was excited about the movie because of the cast. It has an amazing cast and I am a huge Paul Dano fan. And yet I was pretty disappointed. <laughs> I had high expectations though, I will say. But like the cast, I love the cast, but like no, nobody here is giving like an amazing performance. For the most part, everything about this movie was very like middle of the road in my opinion, like it was fine. It wasn't bad, but it wasn't anything too special either. And I was hoping something along the lines of the big short where they do a good job explaining things in terms that the average person will understand. So it's very informative when, while also just being very entertaining with the great performances. Whereas this, like they do not try to explain anything. They are just like, oh, this guy is short selling, which means he's going to lose money. That's all you need to know. <laughs> We're not explaining it anymore. And then multiple people talk about using call options on Robinhood, but it's like, what are call options? Like. <laughs> 
you expect the audience to just know all of these stock terms. And then they like kind of mention what payment for order flow is, which is how Robinhood makes money. And yet even that, like they kind of explain it, but not really. So they did a very poor job at just explaining these things in layman terms so that a broader audience could appreciate the movie. And this was also a movie that I was hoping to have like an emotional experience watching this, you know, because it is an emotional story if it's told right, with just like the individuals who were part of this. However, I wasn't feeling any, any emotion. And there is a scene where the Paul Dano character, he plays Keith Gill, where he's giving his testimony at the House of Financial Services Committee hearing. And that is supposed to be like the main emotional moment of the movie, but I... I, I just wasn't feeling it. And there's another part where Keith Gill is talking to his brother and it's supposed to, again, be like this touching inspirational moment while also being funny. And it just wasn't working for me. Which speaking of funny, I also just didn't find this movie as funny as I hoped it would be. And like I chuckled a few times, but just the humor just wasn't aligned with what I find funny. And so, so that was disappointing too. But I will say there were plenty of other people in the, the theater that were laughing. So just because I didn't find it funny doesn't mean that you won't. <laughs> But yeah, I feel like this movie was just made for like a very specific audience because they don't bother explaining things. And then along with the kind of humor they have, like it's like the movie was made for these Reddit people who were part of this event, which is like is fine on one hand. And yet I feel like they should have made it appeal to a broader audience, which also another thing like that felt off was some of the music choices. For example, in the beginning of the movie, when the stock price is going up and everybody is shocked, they're playing this like song that has ex like sexually explicit lyrics. And I was like taken out of the moment because I was distracted by the lyrics of this song being like, why, why is the song playing right now? You know? And so it just took me out of the moment and it just seemed out of place. And so there were just a number of things like that where either it was the jokes or like the situations or the music choice or you know different things that just felt like they were odd choices to be made in my mind. Having said all of that, like I didn't hate the movie. I gave it three stars. So it was just a very middle of the road movie for me. So if this is something that interests you, I definitely think you should give the movie a watch. And it does not overstay its welcome by any means. The movie is an hour and 44 minutes and it flew by. So there is that. Uh, but before I get into the details of dumb money, I wanted to explain some of the stock terms and investment terms that are used because as I said, the movie doesn't bother explaining anything really. And so that was annoying for me because I wish they would have. So, so I thought I would take it upon myself <laughs> to explain what these things mean. Beginning with short selling. So when an investor sees a stock for GameStop, let's say, if someone sees that the GameStop is selling at $2 a share and they think due to poor management and like an antiquated business model, they think that GameStop will just go down in price. They want to profit off of their failure. And so then they decide to short sell the stock, which means they find a stock broker who will let them borrow stock at $2 a share. And they have a contract where the investor is going to borrow the stock like 10 shares at $2 a share and they agree that that person will sell it back to them within a certain time period for $2 a share so they have to sell it back for the same amount they bought it for plus they pay a fee. So the stockbroker who gives the stock to be borrowed, it's good for them because no matter what happens with the stock, they make money because they charge a fee. And so that's what's in it for them. And you might ask like, well, why aren't they just doing the short selling? And it's because short selling is very risky. So why take that risk when instead you can let someone else borrow your stocks and they take the risk and you still make a profit either way due to that fee that you're charging them. So anyway, so if you're the person doing the short selling, you borrow 10 shares at $2 a share, and then you sell those 10 shares into the market at $2. And then when the stock goes down to $1, you buy back those 10 shares and you only bought it back for $10 total because it's $1 per share, but you sell it back for $2 a share because it doesn't matter what the stock market is doing. Based on that contract, you have to sell it back for the same amount you bought it for. So you sell it back to them for $2 a share. They make a profit off of the fee they charged and you make a $10 profit minus the fee. And so that is how shorting works when it works in the short seller's favor and the stock does indeed go down. However, what happens if the stock goes up? 
And that is where we come into what a short squeeze is. If you like sh are shorting a large number of a certain stock, like that is just public knowledge. Anyone can be aware of that. So if people see that someone is shorting a certain stock, they can do a short squeeze, which is when they get a ton of people to buy the stock, rising, raising the price, which then like screws over the short seller because now the stock is rising. And so it's a short squeeze. And the person who's doing the short selling, like as the stock price goes up, they have the tough decision of being like, do I buy it back now before it goes any higher, even though I'm losing money? Or do I wait it out and hope that it will go back down? But then that's risky because if you keep waiting, it could just keep going higher and higher. And so the losses like can be infinite <laughs> until you buy it back the stocks. Like there's an infinite amount of money that can be lost when you do this, which is why it's so risky. So yeah, so like if you're that person who bought GameStop at $2 a share, but then the stock goes up to $100 per share, if you go ahead and buy it back at that price because you're worried it's gonna go higher, now you are in the negative $98 per share. <laughs> and so yeah, you can lose a ton of money if short selling does not go as planned. And then call options, like I said, multiple characters talk about having call options through Robinhood, Robinhood being the investment app. And call options are just like a contract. So for a small fee, you are given the option to buy a stock at a certain price. So for example, if GameStop is selling at $12 a share, but you think it will be going up, then you can get a call option. And this call option, which is a contract, it gives you the option to buy a GameStop stock within the next month at $14, regardless of what happens, you can buy it at 14. So if within the month, stock goes up to $20 a share, you can use that call option and buy the stock at 14. Even though it's selling for 20, you can buy it at 14. And then if you sell it right away, you make an instant profit or you can just hold on to it. And so, like I said, you pay a fee in order to get a call option. And if you don't use your call option, like that's fine, you're just out the fee that you paid. And so it's not like an infinite loss. The way it is with short selling, it's just you only lose the fee that that you paid in order to have the option to begin with. And then the movie like briefly mentions a pump and dump, which is kind of self-explanatory, but basically like it's when a group, a certain group who is like in the know, they buy up a certain stock and really pump it up and get the price up. And when other people see this stock is on the rise, other outsiders start buying up this stock and it gets pumped up even more. And then the inside group who started this pump, they sell all their stocks and they make a huge profit. Meanwhile, the people who were the outsiders who just kind of unknowingly joined in, now they are left with a losing stock because now like that main group, they pump and dumped where they raise the stock up only to sell it all. And so if you don't have that inside scoop and know when to sell, then you are left either losing money or just not making as much as you could have. And then bull and bear, this you can kind of again get from context, but if someone is feeling bullish about a stock, it means they think it's on the rise and it's gonna do good. And that term is also used for the stock market as a whole, like a bull stock market is a stock market that is just going up, whereas a bear market is a market that is going down. And then payment for order flow. So uh, people questioned how Robinhood made its money because you can be a user and it is apparently free to invest. But as people should know, when it comes to any service that is apparently free, the reason it's free is because you who are using the service, you are the product, <laughs> you know, like social media. The reason social media is free is because these companies are taking your information and selling it to other companies. You should always be wary of a service that is free <laughs> because that means you are the product, you know, and same with Robinhood. So, so they give their stock orders. When you like buy a stock or sell a stock, they give it to a third party who processes that sale. And that is called payment for order flow. And Citadel was the main company they used for this. Uh, and to quote the book, they say, Robinhood bundled up and sold their users trades to market makers, giant financial firms, primarily Citadel, who could nearly instantly analyze the trading flow and profit by taking tiny slivers out of the spreads between bids and asks. Because Robinhood's main users were amateurs who made risky trades and more and more gravitated toward more leveraged and even riskier plays such as options, Robinhood could command a premium from the market makers whose profits went even higher than the more volatile and trading flow. And so Robinhood, it seems like it's like an app for the people, but really they're not catering to the people. They're still helping out these huge big money companies such as Citadel at the end of the day, because they're giving the information and they're also getting, they're also like giving stock prices that benefit Citadel the most, not benefit the people. They want to help benefit Citadel and the other companies that help them. 
And then the last one is clearing. So like I just said, when you buy and sell on Robinhood, it seems instant, but it's not. It actually takes like two days for the order to process. And while this order is processing, like every day, the Robinhood clearing house people, they get a call being like, you need to front this amount of money because this is the activity you got in the last day. So you need to cover this cost until these sales go through. And so that's what clearing is, which will come into play later. And so the more activity, the more buying that's happening, the higher that number is that Robinhood has to front in order to get these sales to clear. So I hope that <laughs> made sense. Uh, I am by no means an expert on this. So this is just based on my own Robinhood usage knowledge and my spouse's knowledge and from reading this book, that is just my take on what these things mean. But from here on out, I will be getting into the details of the plot, which means there will be spoilers for book and movie. So beginning with Keith Gill, AKA Roaring Kitty. So Keith Gill is just your average Joe who has an interest in stocks and he thinks GameStop in 2019, he thinks that it is undervalued and it is public knowledge that the hedge fund Melvin Capital is shorting the stock. And so Gill, he ends up investing $53,000 into it. And he shares his investment ideas on why he thinks GameStop is undervalued. He shares it on Reddit under the thread Wall Street bets, as well as his YouTube channel, which is called Roaring Kitty. And for the most part, people think he's insane that he has put so much money into GameStop. And in the movie in real life, he was married and had one daughter at the time and he was renting the house he lived in. So he was very much, you know, just your average person, like I said. And he was a track star back in the day. And in the movie, this is a more of a thing because we constantly see him running. But regardless, in the movie, we see him interact with his parents and his brother. And we find out that his sister had died in the summer of 2020. And in real life, this is the case where his sister passed away in 2020 and he did have a brother. However, in the book, like we don't hear anything about his extended family. It's just like his wife. And so the brother is a huge part of the movie. Like I said, he's played by Pete Davidson, but yeah, in the book, he like wasn't a character at all. And then in real life, as we see in the movie as well, Keith Gill was fired from his job at Mass Mutual because of this online persona that he had. And they were also sued $4 million because they were not aware of what he was saying online, even though like, why should they be aware of what he's saying online? And he, it's not like he represents Mass Mutual because in YouTube and on Reddit, he never talked about where he worked. And also like, why is it on them to know what their employees do in their downtime, right? So I feel like one, he shouldn't have been fired for that. And two, like they shouldn't have been sued for not knowing what one of their employees was doing because of course they wouldn't, why would they? And granted, they wouldn't have known had he not become so famous, but that whole thing I thought was unfair. Like it's not their fault. And they also shouldn't have fired him for it. So just the whole, the, the way that all was handled seemed very unfair. And yeah, Keith Gill stopped posting in April of 2021. So since then he has like left the public eye, but as of that time, he was still invested in GameStop. So he like sincerely just fell in love with that stock and he believed in it and he just liked the stock as he says. And so yeah, as of 2021, April, 2021, he was still holding. But at the height when GameStop, the stock went up to nearly like 500, I think per share, he had made 53 million, but then he didn't cash out. So then it ended up going down. Which to talk about, you know, the GameStop rise, the movie makes it seem like Keith Gill was the whole reason GameStop went did so well. And he was like really leading the charge. And yes, he was leading the charge, but in real life, it certainly wasn't all just because of him. Like, in fact, in real life, Michael Burry, who is the same guy who like foresaw the 2008 market crash, and he is played by Christian Bale in the big short. So the real guy, Michael Burry, he invested in GameStop. And so he bought like 3% of GameStop's available stock, which is a huge amount. And in the book, we read that Burry's buy didn't just bolster the stock price, it galvanized a portion of the community on the Wall Street bets board, or at least warmed them to the idea that Keith might not be entirely crazy. And then on top of that, this other like near billionaire named Ryan Cohen, he bought 76 million shares. I believe he bought in like August of 2020, or maybe I think it was 2020, maybe 2019. Anyway, so in reality, like it wasn't just thanks to Keith Gill that the Redditors were buying the stock, right? We had these other huge huge names that were buying it and promoting it. And that just really helped the rise. But the movie doesn't mention, you know, Michael Burry or Ryan Cohen, Cohen investing so much into it. But the book and movie do show just like a variety of just your average person who did invest in GameStop. And I really loved this too, because it just shows how people were affected by this just in all walks of life. And the movie even includes a guy who works at the retail store GameStop, which I thought was a nice touch that was not in the book. But yeah, I just really love just the personal intimate view we got into these individuals who were invested. And Melvin Capital, like I said, 
if they are, are shorting a stock at a high enough number, that is public knowledge. And so Melvin Capital had shorted such a high number that everybody knew they were shorting GameStop. And so Melvin Capital became the target of Reddit being like, oh, take down Melvin Capital and just saying all these hateful things about Melvin Capital specifically. And when people were like, you got to hold onto your stock, they were like wanting to take down Melvin Capital in particular. And in January 2021, when the stock was rising, Melvin Capital did lose billions of dollars. But with so much activity happening on Robinhood, because so many people were buying up GameStop, uh, the clearinghouse, they got a call saying that they needed to front $3 billion because of all the activity that was happening. It was like over 3 billion. And usually the amount they need to provide to like cover the cost, it's in like the hundreds of millions, but it's like never in the billions. And so when this happens, obviously the Robin Hood people are kind of like, oh my gosh, like scattering. And they're able to cover the cost ultimately. However, because of this, they say it's because of this, they end up pausing the ability to buy GameStop. And so people are trying to buy it and they're unable to. Like big time investors, they can still do whatever they want. But retail investors, meaning like just the average Joe who is using Robinhood, they are the ones that are stopped from buying. They can sell, they just can't buy. And then at the same time that you could no longer buy GameStop on Robinhood, the Wall Street Bets Reddit board was also shut down. And they claimed that they had shut it down because of the hateful and inappropriate comments. But as Keith Gill's wife says in the movie, she's like, but that's always been there. <laughs> Meaning Reddit has always been that way. So why are they now using that as an excuse, right? It is, and it was quite the coincidence that it happened the same time as Robinhood had limited the buying. And so, and so even though these are coincidences as the book reads, why did coincidences always seem to benefit the people in power? And eventually, you know, Wall Street Bets comes back up and eventually you can buy GameStop once again. But because people couldn't communicate through Wall Street Bets, like that is what was keeping people motivated to hold, right? Like they did not want to do a pump and dump. They weren't just trying to rise the stock so that they could sell it. They were wanting to hold on to it and make a statement and make these big money Wall Street people pay the price, you know? And what was keeping them holding, even when they had made a profit of like hundreds of thousands of dollars, they still refused to sell because of the sense of solidarity, you know, when they would go on the Wall Street Bets board and they felt like they were part of something and they were communicating. And so by shutting down their way of communication, by the time Wall Street Bets came up and Robinhood you could buy again, people had already started to sell and the price was coming down. And yeah, something I thought that the book wrote about really well was just how like the little guys can never really win. Because yes, Melvin Capital lost billions, but ultimately Citadel came in and invested billions of dollars into Citadel to help keep them afloat. And Citadel also worked for Robinhood, like I said. So obviously the shutdown with Robinhood was very suspicious and Robinhood claimed that it was just the clearing cost and they just couldn't afford to have another, you know, multi-billion dollar clearing cost, but it's all kind of suspicious. But a line from the book I wanted to share reads, the rules weren't there to protect the people. They were there to protect the system. The Reddit crowd took that to mean that the only way to win was to try to tear that system down. What they didn't realize was that there was a simpler path to victory. You didn't tear the system down, you became the system. And once you were the system, the rules were there to protect you. And in the book, we have multiple, there's like two characters in particular who bought the stock, who were, you know, on Reddit and they bought the stock and they want to keep holding, but each of them have someone in their life that is trying to convince them to sell. And one of these people, they are two brothers who were in college and one brother bought the stock and he doesn't want to sell because he's like, no, like we're making a stand. But the other brother tells him, you're going to lose every penny of it because, and I mean this in the nicest way, you guys on this board are a bunch of losers and the guys you're up against are sharks. They win, that's what they do. You're up right now, but you'll hold all the way back down. And then there is another great line that reads, it was perhaps the most difficult part of investing, knowing when to accept that you'd won. And the idea to like keep holding is admirable admirable in its way, especially if you're someone like Gil who just really does believe in the stock. But if you're wanting to hold on in order to like make a stand and to prove something to Wall Street, Ultimately, like, you're just gonna end up losing it all because like Wall Street and the big money, Melvin Capital, Citadel, like they're going to win in the end, you know? And so if you just keep holding in order to make a stand, ultimately you are just going to lose even more. And what kind of a statement is that, right? And as someone who like has spent time in casinos in the past, and let's be honest, the stock market is just gambling, right? Like it's just a different type of gambling. But yeah, like you might have this idea of like, oh, like I'm gonna show the casino or I'm gonna show Wall Street. But everybody knows that the house wins. You know, Wall Street wins. There is no getting back at them. So instead, once you are up, realize that you have won and cash out, go home, take your winnings and just be happy, right? Because the house always wins. The system is built 
for these rich people. And so it, again, it might be admirable to be like, I'm gonna show them, but really you're not making as much a difference as you think. And obviously that's kind of going against what this whole story is saying, right? Because these people on Reddit did make a difference, but in the long run, the people who just stayed holding, it doesn't matter. They might, might've been up millions of dollars, but if they stayed holding, they just lost it all. And then what was even the point, you know? And the America Ferrera character, she is still holding by the end of the movie. Whereas in the book, her counterpart had sold but she didn't sell right away like at the height and so she did end up losing like a fair amount of money and so because she didn't sell at its height she's talking to a co-worker and she's saying how like she's such an idiot and the co-worker says I don't think you're an idiot I think you wanted to believe and I'm proud of you for that his words hit her harder than she'd expected they're talking about GameStop a stupid video game company and I like this part too because it shows just how much this meant to the retail investors, right? To the normal people who were investing in this and just, it gave them something to be part of and something to believe in. And the stock market is supposed to be very logical, right? Like short selling a stock, that's just a very logical way of thinking about things. And yet these Reddit people, like they weren't using logic, it was so much emotion, right? And with GameStop too, like so much nostalgia with GameStop. And so because it was so emotionally driven, there was no logic behind it. And that is why it was just so insane. And the big money stock market people were just like so unprepared and couldn't believe what was happening <laughs> because they make their predictions all about logic. And logic is not what was making people do what they did with GameStop, you know? But in the end, like various people were, were called to a virtual hearing for the House of Financial Services Committee, including Gay Plotkin from Melvin Capital, Keith Gill, the Roaring Kitty guy, uh, Ken Griffin of Citadel, and Vlad Tenev of Robin Hood. But honestly, like, I'm not really sure what, the even, what even the point of this hearing was because nothing really came of it. So... I, it, I, it just seems like it was kind of pointless. <laughs> like they were, they were questioning Robin Hood and Citadel and they were que questioning Keith Gill thinking, thinking that he must have like uh, had some inside information or had like some like some sort of like shady intent in promoting GameStop. But yeah, in the end, like it doesn't seem like they achieved anything. But like as far as what has happened since then, Citadel did close in 2022. And then Gill, like I said, he has retreated from the public eye. And then the Robin Hood creators, they at the start of the movie, it said they were billionaires, but by the end of the movie, they were no longer billionaires. I mean, they're still multi-millionaires. But I also didn't love in the end of the movie, the way it says that it's like, we're supposed to be happy that like uh, Tenev and um, I forget his partner's name, like Baj something rather. Anyway, it's like, we're supposed to be happy <laughs> that they lost money and that they were like, quote unquote, struggling. And I, I'm just not interested in that. Like if you are wanting to see these people go down, then how are you any better than the big money people who are short selling stocks, right? Because people who are short selling are profiting off the failure of someone. And so if we're going against them thinking they're bad, <laughs> how are we any better if we're looking at like the founders of Robin Hood being like, oh yeah, take that, you know? So I, I'm just not interested and having that attitude towards anybody. So anyway, I get Robin Hood had their own little shady stuff going on, but regardless. But speaking of Ken Griffin, apparently he is suing the Dumb Money movie because he does not like the way he is portrayed in this film. So that is what he is currently up to. But when it comes to book versus movie, so to recap my thoughts, the book was very informative. And while I do wish he would have dumbed it down a bit more <laughs> to help it be a bit more accessible, I still think it was well told and it did keep my interest throughout and I just really enjoyed the writing style of it. And like I said, it does a good job of capturing this moment in time and why it felt so important to certain groups of people. And why like, you know, I wasn't part of this, I wasn't invested at the time and yet I just love this story because even if in the long run, Melvin Capital was bailed out and you know, the big money people really weren't hurt that bad. It still is just such an inspirational story to see that your average person can still have this kind of effect. You know, we all love the David and Goliath stories. And while the movie, it was entertaining, I, yeah, it just didn't do a good job explaining anything. Like I wish the book had used a bit simpler terms, but then the movie just doesn't try explaining it at all. So again, there were just certain things where I just questioned their reasoning for certain choices that were made with this movie. So yeah, ultimately I would say the book wins between the two of these. I would definitely recommend it if this time period is something that interests you. I, 
did read reviews that said like you can learn the same amount by just reading an article about this, <laughs> which could be true to some extent. So if you really want to dive in, then you could read the book. Otherwise you could just read an article, I guess. But also at the end of the movie, they act like, oh, like, you know, Citadel and whatever, they might all be doing fine. But this changed Wall Street because now Wall Street people have to pay attention to what re retail traders are doing and whatever. But it's like, this happened like two years ago. How can you be saying that they have changed Wall Street? Like it's too soon to claim that they've made some big change to Wall Street, you know? And in some ways, like, I don't like that the movie was going for that message to be like, they changed everything. Because I wanted a story not about a group of people that changed everything. Because honestly, that's not what happened, right? <laughs> Instead, I just wanted something more personal and intimate about how this affected individuals and again, why it meant so much to them. And like I said with how it was in the book, how different people had this realization of being like, you know, why am I still holding, right? Like, am I just gonna end up being a bigger loser if I just keep holding this? Like, what point am I trying to make, you know, if I cash out now? You know, realizing when you've won <laughs> is such an important part of gambling and the stock market. So realize you've won and just cash out. And so, yeah, I didn't think the movie conveyed that kind of message at all. And they were going for like, wow, like they changed everything. When really, like, did they though? <laughs> I think changes were made on an individual level, but not on this huge level that the movie sort of tried to imply. But yeah, so that wraps up my thoughts on dumb money. So share your thoughts on this whole thing down in the comments, what you thought of the movie, uh, your experience with this in real life. If you were one of the investors, I would love to hear your story about it. And then if these like nonfiction stories interest you, I recently covered Blackberry, which was a nonfiction movie that I absolutely loved. I would highly recommend that movie. And after you've watched this movie, you should check out my book first movie episode that I did for it. So, so that was a great one to cover. Love that movie so much. And yeah, if you guys have not subscribed or liked this video yet, make sure you do that. And thank you so much for your support. And if you and I will see you next time. Bye.